All right, welcome back. Oh, sorry, Pierre. I didn't mean to wake you up. But welcome back, honors. Welcome back to where we left off in class when we were talking about the growth of the Spanish Empire. We left off talking about that horrific story about Atahualpa and how he was cremated and given a Christian burial, even though he asked specifically not to have one of those things, right? So we talked about the disgusting conquests of Cortez and Pizarro over top of these different people. Hey, 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 Pierre. Stop nibbling on her feet. She's trying to take a nap. There you go. Good boy. Now, anyway, getting into it a little bit, let's go ahead and understand. Well, come here, buddy. Like, you need to come sit with me. You are, like, like pushing her off the couch. Like, you're being ridiculous. Josie, you get comfy, okay? So, anyway, everybody say hello to Pierre. So, looking at this whole understanding, we need to, like, understand before we go any further, we are going to be getting into a lot of really intense topics that we're going to be talking about in this flip, right? Intense in the understanding of, like, actually understanding how these Spanish colonies make all their money. What's going to be a big effect of these different things? How we're going to progress forward? And we're going to do all this on the Sunday, and then you're going to have a nice little day off on Monday. Oh, my God, Mom's home. Ah. All right, so anyway, but yeah, so sorry, Mom's home, and he's freaking out. All right, so I'm going to let him go. All right, anyway, now. Oh, 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 oh. All right, so anyway, now where we left off, though, we were talking about the conquest of the Aztec and the Inca, and now we're going to progress forward, and we're going to start discussing, well, what are the Spanish going to do when they actually get a hold of all this land? And my wife is currently dancing in her <laughs> toboggan, and she's got iced coffee and stuff like that. Happy anniversary, sweetheart. I love you. What um, class is this? This is my honors Western Civ class. Hello, honors Western Civ. And then there's Pierre. Wait, watch out for my oatmeal bowl and my coffee. Like so. Anyway, now so, but yeah, happy anniversary. I wrote you. Happy anniversary. I love you too. What no. is this song? Oh, uh, we're talking about the uh, no. This is uh, sugar cane. We're gonna talk about the encomienda system where Spanish people forced natives to work for free, and then they all ended up dead, which leads to the slave trade booming after that. We, um, did we talk about why they all died? What? Oh, like malnutrition as well as also, uh, also like, like disease, smallpox, measles, Yeah, we love the Columbian Exchange. That we're talking about. And we're talking about the Columbian Exchange yeah. today. All right, so like, yeah, anyway, so as you can it see. It did not work out for yeah. everyone else. Yeah, it just worked it, out for the Europeans. Absolutely not a... Not approved by I'll me. bring you in to yeah. talk about the Columbia Exchange here in a little bit. Why don't you go get yourself a little something to eat, all right? So anyway, now, so she's also dancing with Pierre currently. Now, looking at this entire thing, to think that I almost considered giving you an old flip at, before we actually had that, like, fantastic little interaction. But now what we're getting into is the colonial administration. How did the Spanish set up colonies? How did they run them? And what are going to be the massive effects of these colonies going forward, right? Also, sweetheart, could you let him out real quick? He probably needs to go to the bathroom. Um, so now looking at this entire thing, though, colonies are going to be then split up and divided into certain territories. These territories would be referred to as vice royalties. Now, a lot of this is very, very understanding when you're looking at the growth of a large area of land. When you're talking about like the actually acquiescing a large area of land, you're going to divide it up into certain little areas and you're going to create basically little provincial states, right? So basically every single uh, colony, or not, excuse me, every single island in the Caribbean was turned into like a state. For example, there was the Cuban vice royalty or the vice royalty of Cuba. And then there was the vice royalty of Puerto Rico. There was also the vice royalty of Lower Mexico, and there was the vice royalty of Venezuela, and there were these other different little areas that they blocked off. And they would appoint a person to rule over each of those things, and that person was called a viceroy, right? And the viceroy was responsible for reporting back to the monarch and discussing the, what was going on, how they were actually producing goods, and br like actually being in charge of shipping and receiving things and preventing smuggling as well. Now, silver and gold is going to be discovered by the Spanish in North, South, and Central America. America, particularly Central and South America. Now, they're going to immediately start setting up very, very large gold and silver mines, as you can see, that as actually like demonstrated right here. This is an actual picture of some of the gold and silver mines that are being set up by the Spanish. The natives are going to be given modern tools by the Spanish that actually include forged metal and iron weapons. And this actually is an engraving picture that was sent back to Spain to the royals so they could see just how much gold and silver was being poured out of these mines, right? Because as we remember when we talked about the Incans and the Aztecs, they had a lot of access to gold. And they actually had access to gold using simple and primitive tools that were actually made out of things like obsidian or rock or and stone. So if they were able to actually access this gold and silver using those tools, imagine the amount of gold and silver that could be accessed if they're using iron and like actual forged metal weapons. Now the disgusting part about it is, let's take a gander at this picture real quick. Who's the ones working in the mines? The natives are being forced to work in the mines. These Spanish people are sitting there staring at them, watching them work, and risk 
their lives, right? For So that they, these Spanish people, can actually prosper off the gold that's being brought out of these mines, which is absolutely disgusting and super messed up. And also looking at these different like mines, as you can see, you've got two men standing there holding up posts to try and keep the mines from collapsing. These mines that were set up by the Spanish, jot this down, these mines that were set, set up by the Spanish were terribly, terribly unsafe, right? Because the Spanish didn't care because it wasn't them that were actually going down there to work in these mines. They were extremely unsafe. They could collapse at any minute. They had no ventilation systems. They could explode if you hit certain methane pockets and things like that. And they oftentimes would lead to the death of many of these natives as they were being forced to work in these mines, right? So like, it's very important to understand also what these Spanish were turning this gold and silver into. They were mostly turning it into currency, actual coin-based currency, like Spanish Spanish coinage, right? So like going forward as well, another big thing that's going to happen is they're going to discover that sugarcane grows phenomenally well in these areas, right? So sugar is going to be a very important raw material that's going to be actually produced in these colonies. Now, really, really quickly, when we talk about like raw materials in general. We'll get to it a little bit more and we'll discuss like what a raw material is a little bit later on. But all that is, is it's an unprocessed good, right? A raw material is an unprocessed good. Like for example, if you were to grow a thing of cotton, the cotton that you pull off the plant is the raw material. You then process it into thread. You can then make that thread into like this sweater that actually has a beautiful logo on it. Go birds because the Eagles are in the playoffs today. Now, so the big thing though, going forward as well, livestock is going to be ranched. And again, who is working all of this stuff? The natives are working all this stuff. As you can see right here as well, here is a picture of natives that are actually been given metal tools and they're planting and distributing sugarcane seedlings into the ground. So they're farming these sugarcane plantations. All of this system, forcing them to work in the mines, forcing them to work on the sugarcane plant plantations, is a system known as the encomienda system, right? The encomienda system, as you can see right here, is in bright red. It is very, very gross, and it's one of the most obscenely nasty things that has ever occurred inside of any like Western civilization's history textbook, right? Due to the fact, or just in Western civilizations in general, because basically it is this one right here, this middle section. This system was a system of forced excuse me, forced labor that the Spanish enacted upon the natives and they could physically abuse them and or torture them or take their families hostage if they refused to work. I'm going to say that again to make sure you heard it and wrote it down. If the natives refused to do the encomienda work, they could have their families taken hostage, they could be tortured, or they could be physically abused. Sometimes they would have digits on their fingers cut off if they refused. They would be whipped or have other appendages removed from them. That is absolutely disgusting because Spain granted the colonies the right to force the natives to work. This is a basically, in its essence, a free system of slavery that the Spanish are going to set up through these different colonies and provincial states and these different vice royalties to mine sugar, or excuse me, to mine silver and gold or to grow sugarcane. And so going forward as well, so you understand, is that in the backs of the Spanish mines, now you don't have to write this down. This is just a chart so you can understand it better. You can kind of take screenshots of this if you want to have it that kind of handy, or you can just Google encomienda, the plan and the reality, and this will pop right up. But the, basically the Spanish claimed that the encomienda system would benefit both the settlers and the natives. They told Catholic representatives this. They told the royals this. They were like, oh, we, the Spanish settlers, will protect, care for, and Christianize the natives, and then the natives will only work a small portion of their day for the Spanish settlers. That was the plan. But the reality was is that Sp Spanish settlers forced long labor, didn't pay them, malnutrition would then kill and like actually like, like, like lead to the death of many of these natives. They failed to protect them, and then when they die, they're going to seize their land to grow more items on it. Natives are going to die from diseases like smallpox, measles, influenza, as well as malnutrition and terrible working conditions. And the encomienda would not end until the late 1700s because the Catholic priests are going to begin to protest it. Spanish Catholic priests. It took other Spanish people protesting this horrific method of forced labor to bring it to an end. Also, Native American revolts also helped it like, end as well. But these abuses continued to end, like progress even then when they replaced it with this thing called the repartimiento. Now, the thing about it, though, also is that's the Spanish colonies in particular. So make sure you highlight encomienda. Make sure you understand everything we just talked about because it's all very, very important. But getting into it now, we also have two other colonial bases that are going to be setting up in North America. Now, North Americans are going to be heavily, like, predominantly colonized by the English and the French, right? Now, when you're looking at either or, you usually always have to start off with the French. So the French, you really wanted to actually set up new colonial areas 
up in North America so they could keep making more money off like that fur trapping of beaver and fishing of codfish, right? So they're going to set up a lot of small, very, very teeny tiny little colonies in Canada to start out. And they actually, that is why even in the modern era, many like Canadians in the northeastern area of Canada and the like, province known as Quebec actually speak French to this day, right? It's known as French Canada. Now, going forward, they're going to go into Canada. They're going to set up some of the smaller colonies like uh, Montreal and, several, and Quebec City and places like that. Quebec City is absolutely beautiful, too, if you ever get a chance to go. Um, the Mississippi River, though, is then going to be used as a conduit to go through North America, almost like a highway, right, where they can easily load up ships and push them down the Mississippi River. This would then lead to the French actually colonizing Louisiana as well. And Louisiana, of course, being named after the 1600s king at the time, Louis XIV, who was just a child like at the time he was actually like in his like single digits he was like either like five six seven eight or nine so now look going into it though like i said their early settlements include montreal quebec louisiana as well as the islands in the west indies particularly what is now known as modern day haiti so do me a favor really hit quick when we see islands in the west indies put haiti right next to it haiti is going to be the biggest french colony in the caribbean now going forward though you have to understand that access of the Mississippi River. So if we look at this map really, really quickly, which is going to be really important, let's look at this side of the map. So you see how the Mississippi River right here is like a conduit through North America. They would use the Great Lakes as well as the Ohio River Valley, and they would float large amounts of goods that are being brought in through here. So everything here in this goldenrod color, those are French colonies. So you've got Quebec right there. They would use all of this area and use that little Mississippi River to go all the way down, and they would actually found New Orleans in 1718, on the banks of the Mississippi River, um, actually where it's now modern day located. And of course, that is why here in New Orleans, we spell Go Tigers with a G-E-A-U-X because of its French like actual understanding. It's why the Cajuns actually exist. Much later on as well, there's going to be this group of French Protestants named the Acadians that would be kicked out of like the northern like areas of Quebec and be forced to find a new home. And they actually immigrated all the way down the Mississippi River and settled in what is now modern day Acadiana, which is in what is now modern day Lafayette. And Lafayette is the origin of the Raging Cajuns football team at ULL, right? And Cajun is literally a derivative word or an amalgamation of the word Acadian, right? So like now, so the big thing you need to understand though going forward as well is that the French are going to have major colonial impacts. But something you need to understand is that the French colonies grew very very slowly okay like so write that down underneath the french colonies stay small and grow very slowly but let's pivot a little bit over to the english right so the english are then going to actually set up their colonies on the atlantic coast and they're going to hug the atlantic coast and actually lead to the original 13 english colonies now your earliest settlements include places like roanoke jamestown and plymouth now the roanoke colony is really interesting because they lost it, right? I know Mackenzie Blank brought this up in class because she knew it really well. The Roanoke colony was a very, very first colony set up by the English, but they lost it completely. They lost it whenever Sir Walter Raleigh came and actually settled that colony on the Outer Banks Islands of Roanoke in the outer like area of North Carolina. He then left for a year and a half and said, hey guys, I'll be right back. When he returns, he actually sees no one there and no remains or physical remains of those original settlers has ever been found. The only thing that was ever left behind in the Roanoke colony because we lost it and they just disappeared was a carving on a tree that said Croatan, right? C-R-O-A-T-A-N. That literally is a Native American tribe in the area. So we think we've been led to believe that the Native Americans may actually have like taken them over, killed them, and then like buried their bodies somewhere else. Now, the earliest permanent colony was in 1607, was founded by the name of Jamestown. It was Jamestown, Virginia. And now the Jamestown, Virginia colony is going to struggle a lot early as well. They're going to go through this period from 1608 to 1610, known as the Starving Times, where almost every single Jamestown settler almost died, right? So if we actually look really, really quickly at this woman named Jamestown Jane, Jamestown Jane, Jamestown Jane is physical evidence that we found of a Jane Doe, a dead body, in an unidentified dead body in Jamestown. And this is what we think she might have looked like, but this is her skull that we found, right? Now, Jamestown Jane's skull has obviously been bashed in in the front so people could apparently access her brain matter, and she has tool marks all over the top of her skull that show where they were peeling the skin off to eat it, right? Literally, Jamestown colonizers were starving so badly that they turned to cannibalism of dead carcass or dead people to actually survive. And they did not actually end up surviving or becoming prominent until the Native Americans showed them how to plant and actually survive the winters there. They're known as the Powhatan natives that actually showed them how to survive in these areas. So the Jamestown colony, though, is going to become particularly prominent when they... 
What? Death Trap for Try? Pocahontas. Pocahontas was Powhatan. Yes. Yeah. Good job, sweetheart. Disney Very movies, proud. y'all. Di- well, Watch your Disney movies. You know she was only picked the yeah, but Disney's inaccurate because she looks very native in the Disney, Disney movie. Is very inaccurate. But you also know that the only reason that Pocahontas was chosen is because she was light skinned and worked but looked the closest name, to white. Wasn't her dad's name Chief Powhatan? Po- Powhatan, yeah, yeah, po- yeah. Powhatan, okay, yeah. Saying. Yeah, so, like, very good. And she also never married John Smith. Um, She might have had an affair with him, we're not sure, but, like, never met John Smith. She ended up marrying a guy named John Rolfe, and John Smith in real life was not, like, good-looking and clean-faced and blonde. All right, so anyway, now, so getting back into it, though, Jamestown, though, did discover a very, very heavy economic product, tobacco, right? So they discovered tobacco from the natives as well, and they actually began to grow and produce tobacco and send that back to England, where it would be sold for a heavy, heavy profit. So make sure you jot that down next to Jamestown, that we have tobacco is being made as well. So then you have your last major colony of the English. It was known as Plymouth, or Plymouth, Massachusetts. It's going to be founded by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and Plymouth is the one that always is talked about as being for religious freedom, right? So whenever you were in like fifth grade and your teacher was like, why were the colonies of the Americas founded? And you were, your response is supposed to be, religious freedom. Well, no, actually, the colonies were mostly started for economic gain. That one was started particularly for, for religious freedom. Later on, there would be a couple other religious freedom colonies, like Maryland, which was for Catholics, and then also like Pennsylvania, which was for Quakers. But we'll get to those guys a little bit later on. The original one, Massachusetts, was actually started by these people that you sometimes refer to as The Pilgrims, right? The Pilgrims making a pilgrimage to this new world to start their colony. Now, really, really quickly, it's a terrible name for them. They came over on this thing known as the Mayflower, which is a vessel. They set up the very first government called the Mayflower Compact. But also, just so you know, there were these people called the Puritans is what their actual name was, is Puritans. They were actually heavily persecuted back in England because the Anglicans really didn't like them. Now, we'll get into who they are a little bit later on, but just make sure you jot down somewhere really quick, Puritans, right? So the other thing you need to understand, though, really, really fast, is that there is going to be a large amount of actual, like, violence that breaks out due to these colonies. Several wars would be fought later on, like, for example, the French and Indian War in the 1700s, over where the borders of these colonies actually existed. Now, I know some of you are like, wait, weren't we just talking about the 1600s? Why are we now jumping all the way to the 1700s? Well, look, we're going to just explain all this kind of, like, in a big scope that, like, the big thing that you need to understand is that looking at this map, you have to understand that these colonial boundaries weren't very very well like like actually like flushed out right like you can't really just say that oh we're on this side of the Appalachian Mountains and you're on the other side we're on this side of the Mississippi River and you're on the other side so as you can see it led to a lot of like disputed territory so you see everything right here that's where the French and the British could never agree on who owns what so this is going to lead to several different wars and one of the biggest ones is actually important to the like actual history of the United States it's the French and Indian War also known as the Seven Years War back in Europe there's going to be fighting over the borders of these colonies France is eventually going to lose its colonies in Canada and Louisiana, but it's going to keep its colony in Haiti. It's going to get Louisiana back in 1800, and then it's going to sell it in 1803, and then all this other back and forth. But we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get closer to it. Now, this is a big thing that is going to be super important that a lot of you are not going to understand, but you need to. We're going to talk about the major effects of all this stuff that, like, is actually going on. So there are huge, massive, major effects of the colonization as well as the actual, like, growth of these different places throughout North and South America. So one of the biggest effects on a Western civilization scale, on a grandiose, impacts everyone in Western civilizations thing, is this thing known as the Columbian Exchange. It's what my wife was talking about when she came in, when she was actually like explaining the Columbian Exchange and how the Native Americans got a really terrible end of their deal in this entire thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get actually closer to it and go on with it. But the Columbian Exchange, what you need to write down is the definition that I'm about to say. The Columbian Exchange is the informal exchange of goods from the Eastern Hemisphere with the Western Hemisphere. So you have to understand when we're looking at the Columbian Exchange, a lot of people struggle with understanding this concept. But there are plants and crops and things and items that grew in North and South America that the Europeans didn't know existed until the 1490s and after, right? Now, we call it the Columbian Exchange because it's named after Columbus, right? Like, that, of course, because 1492 being the key year where these two things begin to cross over. So let's just kind of understand this from a macro scale. So this is Europe, Asia, and Africa. Europe, Asia, and Africa had no idea that North and South America existed until 1492, right? So once that interaction happens, these groups of people are going to start seeing 
different items that other people have. For example, when the Europe, Asian, African like contact with North and South America happens, they're going to start realizing like, oh, you've got tomatoes, corn, potatoes, turkeys, pumpkins, items that they didn't know existed, those items are going to end up coming over to Europe so that actually can like lead to increased nutrition, better actual like dietary thing, um, dietary like, what's the word I'm looking for here? Better, uh, better, better dietary patterns, thank you sweetheart, better dietary patterns in Europe, which is going to lead to an increased lifespan for Europeans as well as like Northern Africans and Asiatic people. And it's, they're going to end up getting the better deal because life expectancy will increase and the resistance to disease will actually grow. Native Americans, when they came into contact with the Europeans, had never seen a horse, had never seen a cow, had never seen sheep or pigs or cattle like that. So they're going to end up receiving that more than anything else in the Colombian Exchange. But also, they're going to get, end up getting the raw deal because sugar cane would be grown in these areas, that they would be forced to work on these plantations. Bananas would be grown on these places that would lead to these things called banana republics in the 1700s, which is terrifying. And then also, the worst thing the Native Americans got in the Colombian Exchange was diseases like smallpox, influenza, measles, typhus, malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough, and all these other things that would lead to the death of some, like, some pre-Columbian society, as much as 90% of them, which is absolutely horrifying. So when we're looking at this whole thing the Colombian exchange is hard to explain but I will go into more depth with it when we actually talk about it in class so the Colombian exchange though is going to lead to an increased economic modality throughout the entire world right so we're gonna see consumerism and subsistence based economics kind of start fighting against each other so the Colombian exchange is gonna to lead to more products more things more goods, more uh, more dietary patterns, more everything, and an actual abundance and surplus of goods in these European and Asiatic countries. Now, what that means is that in the Middle Ages and in the 1400s, most people in Europe lived subsistently. They've made just enough to stay alive. But now that you've got this massive amount of goods coming in, you can actually start working for your money and being a consumer, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in class as well, because this is going to be where we majorly review when we actually have our warm-up. Other key effects include inflation, which is going to be like the actual like limitation of prices on things. And you're also actually going to see the prices on different goods rise because of the availability of money in the economy, mainly going coming from the Spanish and like Portuguese colonies. You're also going to see the growth of supply and demand economics, which is when your supply is up, your demand is down. There you see the two things work inversely of each other and set prices on goods. And you're also going to see a big one. I need you to actually put a star next to this one, the increased power of royals and monarchs, right? You're going to see a massive growth in the power of kings and queens inside of Europe. Like Isabella and Ferdinand grew massively in power because of the fact that Columbus was the one that was paid by them to find these different items, right? So you're going to see King Henry VIII's power grow. You're going to see like the Stuarts back in England, powers, their power is going to grow. All these monarchs are going to grow their power and they're going to begin to make so much money that they can expand their power and actually impose their power onto the nobles and we're going to lead to some different actual sociological patterns and governmental patterns following the period of exploration as well. But when I see y'all in class, uh, like basically Tuesday, I will actually going to talk about the triangular trade slash transatlantic trade network. We're going to talk about a lot of different other things as well. And then we're going to get into the growth of the East India companies. But I'll see y'all then. And I'll also be able to tell you when you're going to have your test. And I'm going to go ahead and post your study guide on Monday, tomorrow, for you to actually start looking at as well. But uh, y'all have a good one. We'll talk about that as well as a little bit later on. I appreciate it. See y'all then.